Welcome to today's workshop, Case Studies and Simulation in Online Courses. Case studies and simulations are often used in face-to-face -face modalities, but they can also be a great learning tool in online courses. Asynchronous online learning might lead to students feeling disconnected because they lose that sense of interaction that's inherent in a face-to-face -face course modality. So humanizing the online classroom is an important step in creating that engaging and interactive learning environment for students and encouraging connections and interactions between students. So that in this workshop, we're going to be discussing how to employ case studies and simulations in online courses um, and how that can help humanize our courses and improve student engagement and learning outcomes. Uh, my name is Amanda Smothers, and I'm the Teaching and Learning Coordinator in our Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning here at NIU. Um, and I'll be your presenter today. Um, I've been teaching college composition and literature for 15 years. Um, and I've been in faculty development for over four years now, four and a half years actually. Um, and I'll take questions throughout and at the end of the presentation. So if you have any specific questions related to what we're covering, feel free to post that in the chat thread and I'll address those as they come up. I've got my eye on that. And then in the text chat, I want you to just tell me what's your department or division, um, what's your role, what do you hope to get out of this workshop? So I'll give you just a minute to, to get that information in there. Can I go first or we need to type it out? Yeah, you can do it um, with your mic if you'd rather do that. Totally. Well, um, my name is Nahal Salimi. I am a faculty at the um, Department of Rehabilitation, Counseling, and Disability Services. Um, one of the reasons that I chose to attend this workshop is because in the fall, um, we are, I am going to teach a class which is uh, mostly about the diagnosis of mental illnesses. And uh, we're going to have a lot of case studies and um, discussions, particularly case studies. That's the reason I thought it could be a helpful uh, presentation for me today. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and Patrick um, put in the chat that um, he teaches an ethics course and wants to check out case study approach to teaching. I'm just going to say mine out loud too, since yeah, definitely with what's going on right now. I'm in public affairs, and I normally teach nonprofit finance and nonprofit management. And this fall, I'll be starting with remote asynchronous courses, which I'm very excited about. And normally in the classroom, we do a lot of uh, case studies and simulations and things like that. And I saw this. Uh, this, this presentation come up, your session here, and I got really excited because I didn't know how to do that online yet. So thank you. Great, and I'm glad to have you all here and um, discussing how to do this online, um, especially if you've done this in your face-to-face -face classes and are just kind of looking at how to um, switch that to an online format. Um, so let's do a little bit of a check-in today too. Um, I'll just have you use the emojis, emoticons, uh, and share just how you're doing. Um, this is something that I do in my online synchronous classes when I'm teaching. Um, it just gives me a sense of where everybody's at that day. So I know, you know, if someone's having a bad day, maybe they're not going to be as, as responsive. Um, and I will share mine as well. I shared my coffee emoji there. Um, because I need some more. I just ran out right before <laughs> this started. So after this, I'll definitely be getting some more coffee. Great. So it looks like we're doing, doing well today based on our emojis. Um, in this workshop, we're going to talk about what it means to humanize an online course. We're going to discuss disengagement briefly in asynchronous online courses because that can be an issue. Um, but Let's be honest, it's an issue across the board, regardless of modality right now, especially post-pandemic. Um, 
And then we'll also explore experiential learning and critical thinking. We'll assess the benefits of case studies and simulation in student learning and engagement. We'll look at some examples. Um, I'll give you some, um, some websites where you can get examples of case studies and simulations that could be deployed in your online courses. Um, there's a lot out there and it's not an, ex it, they aren't exhaustive lists, but I tried to kind of get a well-rounded um, sampling of where we could get these case studies, um, mostly free, which is great. And then also we're going to just brainstorm some ways to integrate these strategies into your individual disciplines so that you can apply it. So first, um, I just want you to think about these questions and then you can share them out. You can unmute yourself again if you prefer that. You can type it in the chat if you, you prefer that. But just what have you noticed in your online courses in terms of student engagement and learning, um, you know, if you've taught online courses before? Um, why are you interested in learning more about case studies and simulation in online courses? So I'll give you a minute to think about that. And then if you want to unmute yourself, um, you can share. Or if you want to share in the chat, you can do that as well. And I generally give my online students the opportunity or the, the option to do either one of those things. You know, sometimes your learning environment when you're in an online course isn't conducive to sharing audio or video. Um, so I try to remain flexible with my students in that regard. Well, I'll go first here. Um, I haven't taught an online course before. I've worked with asynchronous uh, remote work teams for many, many years. And I do believe that that's going to be the future. And I know my students, it's part of an executive education program. They're going to be engaged in that too. So I'm eager to bring something interested into online learning. I do know what my colleagues say, and it is very hard to keep students engaged and interested. And I like case studies. I like simulation. It seems that people get a lot out of it, and so do I. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to using this as a new tool. Great. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, Patrick says, um, it's hard for me to promote and assess engagement in an asynchronous class. Offering case studies seems an effective approach, but how to do it? So yeah, we'll, we'll definitely talk about that. Thank you for sharing. And Nahal. Um, says some students may find online learning to be engaging and enjoyable. Others may face challenges in staying focused and motivated in a virtual environment. Very true, definitely. And that kind of leads um, well into the next thing that we're going to talk about, which is what it means to humanize an online course. So the key to humanizing our online courses is, is to be intentional about building, building relationships. Um, so those relationships enables strong connections between our students, between ourselves and our students. It helps develop mentorship opportunities with, with us as instructors. Um, it encourages that deep uh, engagement with our course content. There are a ton of strategies and methods and tools and techniques um, that can help us humanize an online course. One such is experiential learning such as case studies and simulation. So intentional experiential learning approaches like case studies and simulations can help us foster a more humanizing course if they're designed in a way that humanizes the discipline, but also allows for interaction among our students, between our students, um, and between students and the instructors. So experiential learning can be used as an additional tool to humanize our online course, along with others like posting a welcome video that shows your student that you're an actual human being, um, sharing information about yourself, professional information, a little bit of personal information to an extent that it's appropriate to share with students, um, and other ways of fostering human connections with all of our course participa 
participants. Um, so using simulations and case studies can be a way to sustain those connections. So sometimes we do in an online course, a lot of like front loading of trying to create connections with an introduction discussion board or introduction videos, uh, welcome videos, but we don't sustain that throughout the class. And this is one way to do that through, through case studies and simulations. So I'm just gonna talk briefly about, um, we don't have closed captioning in um, there's no auto closed captioning in um, Blackboard, but or in Collaborate. But I will send a I will also send a um, copy of the recording, and that will be closed captioned. I hope that's all right. Yeah, sorry about that. <clears throat> sometimes I do these in Zoom. Sometimes I do them in Collaborate. Zoom is great because it has the auto captioning. Collaborate needs to to catch up <laughs> um, with accessibility. Um, so disengagement in asynchronous online courses, <clears throat> as educators, sometimes it can be difficult to be sure why students are disengaged unless we ask them directly. Um, so I found this Harvard Business College survey of a handful of students, and these are some of the common reasons why students disengage according to these students. Um, so one of them said the professors just lecture with no energy or passion for the topic. Um, one of them said of online classes, there are so many possible distractions at home. Um, another said lack of real world application. Another said if the lecture is too long, it can be challenging to keep students continuous attention. Um, and that uh, also the student noted that that applied to online learning as well. So if we upload you know, a two to three hour, even one hour, even 30 minute video of us lecturing, um, that's going to be a lot for a student to be able to sit there and actually um, listen to and engage with and learn from and just listening for 30 minutes or an hour or two or three hours. Um, and then some professors read the content directly from the presentation slides without explaining it further, and that can make for a boring lecture. Um, so, in other words, we want to make sure that we're not just reading things that are on the screen that students could read themselves, but also expounding upon them. So let's zero in on that one specific comment, um, student comment from this survey, which was the lack of real world application. And here's what the student had to say about its importance. The student said students are increasingly finding educational value from other resources and questioning the gap between what's taught in classrooms and what they need to learn to excel in the real world. Rather than extensive reading assignments and large cumulative tests, professors should consider integrating timely current events or discussions into their material. Many topics from STEM to humanities can also be taught more effectively through project based application. Um, so the student really highlights and really pinpoints what's so great about um, case studies and simulation for student learning, particularly in online classes. Uh, so we we tend to have a lot of reading in our online classes, or at least I do. Um, don't really do cumulative tasks. They mostly teach writing, but um, you know, professors, this student says, should consider integrating timely and current events. We can do that through simulations and case studies. Um, discussions, we can do discussion with case studies and simulation as well, you know, follow up discussions for simulation, for example. Um, and, you know, it really applies to all subjects. Um, and case studies and simulations are definitely um, along that project based application. Or at least we can design them to be. So experiential learning and critical thinking. Um, John Dewey said, Experiential learning, first of all, has been around for a very long time. So back, way back in 1938, which is depressingly almost 100 years ago now, um, there's an intimate and necessary relation between the process of actual experience and education. So I think what that previous student was really getting at is this disconnect between um, education or classroom learning and experience, what we're supposed to do with that learning. And we need to 
connect those dots for our students. We need to give them that experience, that experiential learning. Um, and then in one resource that I'll share the link with you, uh, they said in, in instructors interested in developing critical thinking, which I think is really a cornerstone of a lot of disciplines is, is critical thinking in that discipline. Um, but instructors interested in developing critical thinking need experiential exercises that provide students with challenging circumstances. Challenges can be found in exercises that require them to incorporate factual and theoretical knowledge in a manner that highlights their ability to discern elements of a particular situation. And such exercises require students to organize the evidence of problems or opportunities, validate assumptions, and select the appropriate theories or analytical procedures to make effective decisions. So experiential learning is also referred to as learning through action. Um, learning by doing, learning through experience, learning through discovery and exploration, and case studies and simulations definitely align with that. Um, instruction within experiential learning is designed to engage students in direct experiences that are tied to real world problems and situations in which the instructor is facilitating rather than directing student progress. So this is really student um, student led learning or student forward learning and ex in experiential learning the instructor is guiding again rather than directing the learning process where students are naturally interested in learning and that's really hard to cultivate that natural interest in learning but one way we can do that is through you know developing interesting case studies interesting simulations that help students see how what they're learning in the classroom or what they're learning in our online course um, can be applied to real world situations. So we're teaching them what is the value of this education um, and how does it apply to my life or to the broader, broader life um, and just in general. So qualities of experiential learning are those in which students decide themselves to be personally involved in that learning experience. So students are actively participating in their own learning. They have a personal role in the direction of that learning. Um, Kolb in 1984, um, in talking about learning styles, talked about experiential learning and the different sort of steps in the process of experiential learning. So one is concrete experience where the learner is encountering this concrete experience. It could be a new experience or situation. It could be a reinterpretation of an existing experience in light of new concepts that we're teaching them in the course, for example. Um, the second part of this is reflective observation of that new experience. So the learner is reflecting on that experience in light of their existing knowledge. Um, and then, you know, identifying any inconsistencies between their experience and between this experience um, that we're giving them with the case study or the simulation and their prior understanding. Um, and then the next part is abstract conceptualization. And that's where reflection gives rise to a new idea or modification of an existing concept that the person has learned. And then finally, we have active experimentation. So we've got this newly created or modified concept um, that gives rise to experimentation. And then the learner is applying their idea to the world around them to see what happens. All right, so let's talk about the benefits of case studies and simulation and student learning and engagement. So one advantage of teaching with case studies and simulation is that students are actively engaged. They're figuring out the principles uh, of whatever concepts we're trying to teach them by abstracting them from examples or engaging with the simulation. And this helps our students to develop multiple skills. It helps them develop skills in problem solving, in using analytical tools, depending on the case. It could be qualitative, quantitative. Um, in decision making and complex situations and in coping with ambigu ambiguities. So ambiguity is, is an important part of developing those critical thinking skills that we want to develop in our students. Um, 
if we have something that's clear cut, they're not going to have to work as hard to figure it out. So if there's ambiguity, if there's gray area, if there's no right or wrong answer, but they need to work out um, an answer nonetheless and, and advocate for that answer and use evidence and, and use experience to support that, then that's going to develop those critical thinking skills. So case studies versus simulation. Um, case studies have been part of education for a very long time uh, in medicine, in business, in the military. Um, maybe you want your students to be, to assume a particular role, for example, of a, a, if we're in education of a school teacher or an instructor professor that's dealing with, you know, a difficult or a possibly dangerous student. Um, our case study would provide simulated information gathering from different resources and then take students through the process of assessing the case. Um, we could also integrate something like an online journal that students could use to write down their findings, compare their answers with each other. They could engage online in a discussion board um, where they, they share those findings. Um, or they could just submit those to us and then we can kind of foster uh, an online discussion based on those results that, that our students found. Um, simulations, on the other hand, allow us to interact with maybe a physical model or a digital model or an abstract process. Um, something like, for example, the di digital simulation game SimCity. Um, it would be an example of a simulation. So in the occasions where we would need in an interactive way to help our students understand a difficult concept or process, a simulation may be the way that we meet that need. Um, simulations can be more involved than case studies. Um, they might involve taking on a specific role and then trying to solve a problem or work through an experience. Um, you know, in a case study, you might be looking inside and outside, but you might not be taking on that specific role to solve the problem um, unless we specifically design our case study assignment in that way. Um, and then also part of the goal of a simulation is to put students in a situation where they're actively involved in, in simulating, you know, what might happen in this real world. And I'll show you some examples of each of these. So these are some examples that I've curated for case studies that could be deployed in online courses. And I will share these with you in a follow up email along with the recording of, of this workshop. Um, but I've got examples of case studies, business case studies by company. Um, there's a case studies directory from Yale that has some interesting case studies in there. Um, it's from Yale Business School. Um, and some of them are, are, they've got the drama school as well. So you've got the business side of drama, of theater. Um, and they've got some case studies with that, which is really, could be really interesting. Um, from the National Science Teaching Association, we've got some environmental science case studies um, from the Equality and Human Rights Commission, some health and social care case studies, um, and then from University of Washington, a journal of teaching cases in public administration and public policy, um, and then also the um, University of Buffalo has the National Center for Case Study Teaching and Science. Um, and they've got a bunch of science case studies as well. Um, so you can find a lot of case studies online to share with your students. You could even um, share with them, you know, a list of case studies. So from one of these websites or there's also I'll, I'll share with you um, some open educational resources that you can use um, that have, you know, sort of a repository of case studies and you can give them some choice in, in case study that they want to look at. Um, that could help engage them as well and, and humanize your course even further because they can choose something that they're interested in rather than everyone doing the same case study. You could also use that as a peer uh, interaction and peer teaching opportunity. So if you have them choose their own case studies, um, choose different case studies, then they can teach their peers what you know was involved in that case study um, and interact in that way too. Um, and then I've also got some, some simulations that can be deployed in online courses. Um, most of these are free. The first one is uh, paid. Um, so business simulations, they're, they're actually paid online. 
Um, but there's a UCAR Center for Science Education also has some weather, climate, and atmosphere uh, simulations. There's some simulations from University of Colorado Boulder um, for science and math. There's a really interesting, if you're in social sciences um, or public policy, there's um, a Syrian refugee experience simulation from BBC, um, which is, I started doing it and it's very interesting. So that could be very engaging. Um, and then spent has a poverty simulation. Um, which is also good for you know public policy or political science, something like that, or even for a different humanities class. You know, any of these simulations um, you could adapt to um, whatever your your subject is. Um, so, or you can create your own simulations too. There's plenty of of resources online to create simulations. Um, let me go back one. Make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Okay, yep. Okay. So I make sure I'm not forgetting anything in my notes here. All right, so integrating experiential learning, and this applies to any kind of experiential learning, um, including case studies and simulation. Um, but you definitely want to plan ahead of time um, and then plan to replan when you do the simulation or the case study assignment again. So once the experiential learning experience has been decided upon, so you've decided I'm going to do this case study assignment or I'm going to do this simulation, we want to plan our, our students' experience by tying it to our course learning objectives. Um, so we don't just want to do case studies or simulations for the sake of doing case studies or simulations because we think it's going to be something active for our students to do. We want to make sure that we are fulfilling a learning course learning objective. Um, and we want to also determine what students are going to need to successfully complete that exercise. So do they need resources like do they need to read something ahead of time? Do they need a worksheet? Do they need to do some research? Do they need a rubric for how they're going to be evaluated for this case study or the simulation? Um, do they need any extra supplies or directions to any you know, campus or off-campus locations? So if we're doing something like a simulation using virtual reality um, and they need to come borrow a virtual reality headset um, or use one in a lab on campus. You know, what, what information do they need? What resources do they need? We need to plan that out. We need to make sure that our students um, know ahead of time what they need in order to be successful and to complete the case study or the simulation. We also need to determine the logistics. So if we're teaching online, can they just access all of these materials online or do they need to um come to campus to do this um, do they need to buy their own equipment to be able to do this um, so logistically what might be some of the challenges for students and how can we mitigate maybe those challenges as well um, how much time are students going to be going to need to complete that experience um, especially with you know asynchronous courses we want to take into consideration the whole course experience. So how much time do they need to do other things in the course? Do they need to review the lessons? Do they need to re to do reading assignments, um, other assignments in the course? And then where does this fit in? Where does this experience fit in? How long of a time frame are we going to give them to do this, this task, this, this assessment or this learning activity? Um, and where does it fit in our course? And how are we going to communicate with students you know, how much time they're going to need to set aside to be able to complete this successfully. Um, because we want our, generally students are taking an asynchronous online course because they have other responsibilities. They want that flexibility, but they also need to know um, the information uh, so that they can plan to do this on their own time. Uh, will how will the experience end? So what are how are they going to share 
this experience with you? How are they going to share it with their classmates? How is this going to help us humanize our course? Um, what forms of assessment are, are we going to employ? Do they just need to show us, you know, is there going to be a worksheet where they have to show us how they worked through the case study? Um, or do they need to work through the case study and then record a video of themselves talking about it? Or do they need to post to a discussion board to share with their classmates and you? Um, are we going to be using just a, an end assessment or are we going to use ongoing assessments like, like observations or journals um, or, you know, we're just using an end of experience assessment. Maybe we have a written report or some sort of project that they have to put together or a self-assessment or peer assessments or combinations of all of these things. Um, so we want to make sure that we're, we're planning it for ourselves and for our course, but also planning it out thoughtfully for our students and anticipating what they're going to need to be successful. Um, the next step in integrating experiential learning into our teaching is to prepare. After we've done all of our planning, then we want to prepare our materials. We want to prepare our rubrics and assessment tools and ensure that everything is ready before that experience happens for our students. Um, and then we facilitate. So once we've started our teaching, we're going to facilitate this experience with our students. Um, we commence the experience. We don't just throw it at our students and, you know, throw them out in the middle of the ocean and, and hope that they can wade water. We want to um, <clears throat> guide students through the process of finding and determining the solutions for themselves. So we don't want to give students all the content or all of the information and all the complete answers to their questions. We want to guide students to find those answers to go those questions themselves. And we want to give them just enough information at the beginning of how to work through the process rather than, you know, here's the solution. It's how do I arrive at that solution? So we want to guide them. We want to facilitate their learning. We don't want to give them the answers, though, or to lead them to a solution that we prefer. And then finally, we want to evaluate. Um, so was this experiential learning activity, was this case study activity or the simulation successful? Um, we can determine that in a few different ways. We can look at that during discussions with our students. You know, this can be asynchronous discussions online through a discussion board or yellow dig um, or um, through a voice thread discussion. Um, we can have students submit reflections, um, have debriefing sessions online asynchronously or synchronously if you're teaching a synchronous online class. Um, and de that debriefing is that culminating experience can also help to us to reinforce and extend the learning process with our students. Um, but we also want to make make sure that we're taking this evaluation um, and applying that to planning for the next experiential learning experience. Um, so we don't just want to deploy this this experience the same way every time we want to do what we do with all of our teaching, which is evaluate our teaching, evaluate our assessments, evaluate our learning activities, find out whether they were successful or not. If not, why? Or, you know, maybe it's a combination of both. There were some successes and some some failures. Um, and then we need to figure out how to do it better the next time or how to improve it um, the next go around. So really, this experiential learning process can be really just the process we're teaching all around plan prepare facilitate evaluate and then start the process all over again some additional resources that i want to share with you and i will share these with you in my follow-up email is um yale's porvo center for the Te for teaching and learning has case-based learning um, resource that explains um, case-based learning um, in some detail as well um, UFC, UCF, University, uh, um, I can't remember what the name of it's, it's a Florida university, um, is teaching online pedagogical repository um, in which they have a create a case method group activity to engage students in critical thinking. So that's a, another resource that'll be helpful if you're looking at um, group activities with case studies. Um, 
There's also an open access case study website um, list from Sheridan College's li uh, Library LibGuide. Um, there is a journal article on developing critical thinking skills simulations versus cases, and that's in the Journal for, of Education for Business. Um, Kent State has simulation as a teaching strategy. It's just a brief kind of guide of using simulation as case strategy or as teaching strategy, and it's got some steps in there as well, which are could be really helpful. Um, Boston University Center for Teaching and Learning has using case studies to teach, and then Harvard Business College has an interesting article. Um, it's more of like a blog post on why your students are disengaged and what you can do to draw them back in. All right, so I just want to do a little bit now of brainstorming. Um, and I'll give us just a few minutes to think about these things. And you've probably already been starting to think about them. But what are some ways that you could integrate case studies and or simulation in your individual disciplines or specific courses? What are you thinking of? Um, what would be the benefit to your students and their learning? So the what and then the why is this beneficial? And then how do you think it would change or improve out outcomes in your online course? So what are some ways you could do this? What would be the benefit to students and their learning? And how do you think it would improve learning outcomes in your online course specifically? So take a couple minutes to think about this and then share whenever you're ready. You can unmute yourself or you can post to the chat, whichever you prefer.
Great. So um, we have one comment in the chat so far for the case studies and counseling majors. I can think of discussing real life case studies related to the course content during class discussions. I can also think about utilizing role playing exercises to simulate real world scenarios and it would help with active engagement and participation, increased motivation and interest, as well as decision making and judgment skills. I think that sounds great. Um, all right, so another comment is uh, integrating case studies, introducing to students through case studies uh, to real world ethical dilemmas in the area of school business management, asking them to reason through these case studies by applying course concepts and frameworks that could be done in small groups. And the benefit comes through application. Ethical frameworks don't remain abstract. Rather, students get practice in using them, seeing how these frameworks can actually scaffold action and ethical decision making. In terms of outcomes, the hope would be that students come to recognize the relevance of course content and importance of applying conceptual understanding to the solving of ethical dilemmas. Great, thank you for that. All right, any other thoughts before we move on to Q&A? Oh, case studies will help students understand what finance actually is. Most nonprofit finance is just a bunch of jargon and algebra. Memorizing formula is a truly archaic teaching style. I was in those classes as a student. It was so boring. Nonprofit finance is a pretty passionate business, the intersection of mission and money. The politics of decision making among a wide variety of stakeholders, also the risk of making a bad decision and affecting the people you're trying to help. Case studies and simulations show how finance is practiced. That's the most important. There are apps for all the formulas. Great. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, do we want to focus on sort of the things that students can use, you know, an app for um, the nitty gritty formulas, or do we want to humanize that and really? show them what it's like working within that um, system. Great, thanks so much. All right, so I left some time for Q&A. If anyone has any questions um, that I can answer, I am happy to do so, and I'll give you a second to, to formulate those questions. And if you want to come on mic to do that, or if you want to post them to the chat, I'm open to either way. So I'm really excited about using case studies and I always check myself with that and say, what could go horribly wrong? When is this not a good idea? What are some instances and in where it didn't work and what can I learn from that? So I've heard a lot of the positives. Um, what do you think the negatives are? You know, I think anything can go wrong, right? Um, even with something just benign that I've taught in class, it can just, be a total flop. So I think really the important thing um, is just being able to adapt and pivot when that happens. Um, you know, some students might need some more guidance. Um, particularly, I think something that I could foresee is students who have had a lot of their previous, the, the, you know, the few past few years um, learning online. Um, and maybe not having developed the critical thinking and the socializing as much as previous students might have uh, through no fault of their own. They might need a little bit more guidance. They might need some, some assistance with that. Um, so one thing that you could do to maybe mitigate some of those issues is doing something together, something guided first to show them through the process you know, so a sample case study that you can all work through kind of together, or maybe write on, annotate a shared document um, so that they can kind of see the process um, or you can post, you know, yourself working through something um, so that they can see that process as well. Um, or doing, you know, a simulation together, a sample simulation together just to kind of, because one other issue that there might be is if you're using um, uh, software a simulation software. 
um, you know, maybe they might have some technical difficulties. So working through those first before they actually have to do something um, that's going to have impact on their grade, for example, um, might be something that you'd want to think about, particularly with, with an online asynchronous class. It can be kind of difficult um, and you don't want to be fielding, you know, depending on your class size, dozens of, of emails from individual emails from student having the same issue and having to answer that question over and over again. So if you can anticipate maybe some of those problems ahead of time and work through them um, before students get started with that, that might be uh, a good idea. Um, something else with case studies that might um, not be really be a problem, but just be surprising is how different students uh, might approach a problem um, and what they see as a problem within a case study and what they see as potential solutions. Our students aren't monolithic, so they might come into our classes with different political beliefs, different social beliefs, um, and we should anticipate that um, and not penalize students for not giving an answer that we want them to give. Um, so as long as they are demonstrating their learning, demonstrating um, their course outcomes, you know, we need to kind of look at maybe not being surprised by students approaching a case study from a different angle. I hope that helps or answers that, your question. That was really incredibly helpful. Thanks. No problem. Any other questions or concerns? And if you have a question to post to the chat, you can do that too, if you prefer not to be on mic. Well, I'll just pepper you with questions if no one else has any. <laughs> yeah. um, at this point, or they're still thinking. Um, how do you see uh, these case studies uh, playing a role as, as we advance uh, asynchronous remote learning? Because it seems to me that it's gone from what used to be, oh goodness, I had a correspondence course way back in the mm -hmm. day, to something that's much more realistic for a lot of knowledge workers. So yeah, what are your thoughts on how it's evolved and trends into the future? Yeah, I definitely think that there's a lot of opportunity, um, particularly since there's a lot more demand I, in my experience or my from my perspective for online learning from students, but they also want engaging online learning. So I think the, um, the differences in like, uh, I took an online class when the early days of online when there wasn't a whole lot of it um and it was basically just read the book view these these powerpoint slides online and then take the tests um and i think it's involved so much in the past gosh how long ago did i do that like over 20 years ago um in the past 20 years online learning has and i think students demands for it are going to are going to change too so students just as they want in our face-to-face -face classes, they want more than just to sit there and listen to a lecture for three hours. Um, they want more than just reading slides or, or listening to slides being read to them and reading the textbook in an online class. They want practical application. They want us to show them how, and I think it's essential for us to show them how what they're learning applies to what they might be doing outside of the classroom, either in their future profession or even just um, in their, um, you know, lives as citizens. Um, because I think that if you look at surveys um, and polls of, of students these days, they're seeing they're, the value of a college education um, has they, they're not seeing as much of the value of the, of the college education these days. Um, so we need to help them see that value. Um, and help them see how 
this really applies to what they're going to be doing and how it how it is valuable to them because it, we can't just assume that students are going to passively especially with this new generation of students they're they're challenging things a lot more um, they're not just accepting the status quo and so we need to push back against that status quo as well and really make those connections for our students and and how this applies to the real world. We can't just expect them to transfer these skills. We need to show them how to transfer those skills. And I think that the institutions and the courses and the professors that do that are going to be a lot more successful and have more longevity in their online programming. Also, to be frank, it's just a lot more fun. When I started shifting my students to that, we all had a it lot is. more fun. Yeah, because I mean, do you want to just read another discussion board? Minutes yes. On finance formulas and stuff. I, I can't do that. Yeah. I mean, no, and nobody wants I, to listen to that either. <laughs> no, no. And I tell them, I'm like, I'm, I'm looking at this and I, I find this boring. So, because I would come into the class and have them fill out uh, kind of surveys, words, and do word cloud. And the first thing that always came across the top was boring. Mm -hmm. I was like, yep. Yep, I hear you. We're going to try not to do that. And so, yeah, so are students beginning to expect case studies in the synchronous learning courses? I don't know if they're um, expecting case studies. studies. Yeah, I don't know if they're expecting case mean, studies which? specifically. Um, I know that case studies have been around, obviously, forever in like law <laughs> courses, right. but I think, you know, I don't know that they're expecting that per se, but they are expecting more hands-on learning. They're expecting more of like, how do I apply this? They don't just want to passively receive information because that's not really learning anyway, is it? They want to do something with it. And I think that case studies and simulations are a couple of ways to do that. There are other ways as well, but I think those are a couple of good ways to do that. We've got about five minutes left. Any other questions or anything else anyone wants to share? All right. Well, if you think of anything, like I said, I'm going to send a follow-up email to everyone who's here live today. Um, probably sometime this afternoon with links to all of the resources that I've shared throughout the presentation today. Um, and my contact information will obviously be there. You can also contact our Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning with any teaching, um, pedagogy, instructional technology need. Um, we'd be happy to help you out with that. We've got our CETL help um, website, which is um, niu.edu slash CETL slash help. Um, and there's multiple different ways to get in touch with us there, whatever your preference, online, phone, web conferencing. Um, there, we also have some face-to-face -face availability too, depending on the day of the week. Um, and then our upcoming programs, if you're interested in more workshops um, or other programs like our Teaching Effectiveness Institute in August, um, that'll be on our upcoming programs page. And just our website in general has a lot of resources. Um, and instructional guides and tutorials um, and, and things like that, toolkits as well. Um, so feel free to, to connect with us um, in whatever way works for you and meets your needs. Um, and thank you so much for joining today for um, our workshop on case studies and simulation and online courses. Uh, and I will send you this recording after the fact as well so that you have access to it if you want to come back to anything. Um, but thanks everyone for being here and feel free to reach out to me um, anytime if you need help with, with case studies and simulations when you're deploying them in your online classes.